We are back once again on Canada's Great Unknown with another trilogy of stories coming from across the country. This time, we are telling you about this nasty creature called the Wendigo. It's not a pretty sight by those who've experienced this monster. These stories come from up north, the prairies, and Ontario. Close encounters that would give anyone a reason not to head into the Canadian wilderness again. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these allegedly true stories of Wendigo from areas you may know. Also, if you have a story that you would love to share with us, email us at Canada's Great Unknown at gmail.com. We would also love it if you followed us on social media, both on Instagram and TikTok at Canada's Great Unknown, and on Twitter at CGU Stories. And if you wouldn't mind, hit that subscribe button below and ring that bell right here on YouTube so you can follow along every time we post new content to Canada's Great Unknown. Don't forget after to leave a comment below and let us know what you think or stories you would like to hear. Hi Canada's Great Unknown. Thank you for letting me submit my encounter to you guys. I found you after following Merle on his Paranormal Road Trippers TikTok. I'm 22 years old and currently live in Oakville, Ontario. When I was 17, I was preparing for my graduation year. Me and my friends decided to drive north into the woods for our pre-grad camping trip. There were 12 of us there, a mix of guys and girls, as one of our friend's family had a piece of property that backed onto Algonquin Provincial Park. It was the September Labor Day weekend before we were to head back to school. It took us a couple of hours to get to the park, and then another couple hours for all of us to set up our tents, lawn chairs, dig a fire pit, start a fire, you know, your typical camping weekend stuff. It was a weekend to chill and relax and hang out with friends, knowing this would probably be the last time all of us would be together before we started our separate lives. Yes, we'd still all remain friends, but we weren't naive enough to know that to get this many friends together, who've been together since elementary school, again, after this, would be extremely tough. Some of us were preparing for college, one of us was preparing for the NHL draft, others were just preparing for life. But the main thing this particular weekend was we didn't have to worry about it. That Friday evening, my buddy Aaron and I, along with a couple of the girls, Berkeley and Melissa, decided we would take care of the firewood situation so that way we had enough to burn for the night and roast some hot dogs, s'mores, and marshmallows all night long. The forest was about 100 yards away. So we grabbed a couple of flashlights and started our trek into the trees to collect some sticks. I carried the axe in case I could chop up some trees and split some wood easily. We wandered along the deer trails for about 15 minutes before we found some wood and sticks to collect. I filled up the arms of Aaron and Berkeley so that way they could start their walk back to camp. Aaron had always had a secret crush on Berkeley for years, so I was playing Cupid. I decided to give him a little bit of alone time to chat with her. That left Melissa and I. We walked a little deeper into the forest when we found a small, dead tree that had fallen over. Looking at it, it would be pretty easy for me to cut through, since I'm in pretty good shape, and the amount of wood I could chop would easily fill the arms of Mel and myself. I got about halfway chopping through the wood, when Melissa and I started picking up this, this smell. The odor was pungent and almost made me want to puke. My God, that's awful. Smells like something died or something. I didn't know what to tell her. I'd never smelled something that bad before. Plus, I didn't want to think about it. We quickly loaded up our arms and I grabbed the axe and away we made our way back to camp. As we sat down around the fire and into the night, many of my friends decided to crawl into their tents and head to bed. I was still up with Aaron and Berkeley, 
Melissa was one of the ones who headed off to Slumberland as well. We turned the music down and just sat there stoking the fire and talking about college and life. There was a breeze that started to pick up, so I grabbed my hoodie and put it on. A few minutes after that, though, that grotesque smell was faintly back. The other two smelled it as well. Zach, did you fart? Aaron asked laughingly. I wish that was me, I said. Then it clicked in. That was the smell from the forest. You know what's weird? Melissa and I smelled that stench a few minutes after you two had left us in the forest, I stated. Berkeley jumped up saying, it must be Melissa's ass then, because that girl can rip them. We all laughed. I chimed in, I think it's just a skunk or something. Nothing to worry about here because there's just way too many people and too much noise to attract the wild animals out here. After that, we all went off to our tents and went to bed. The next day, though, trust me when I say, shit got real. I woke up to the smell of bacon. I got dressed, then unzipped my tent and crawled on out. Out of the 12 of us, eight were awake. It was nine in the morning. My buddy Max had made a fire and put a frying pan on top to cook up the breakfast delight. I saw that the firewood was pretty low, so I stated that while everyone was still a little groggy, that I would head back into the forest to grab some more wood. I got to the tree line and entered on in, not thinking of anything but firewood. I got about 20 yards in when I started to feel like I was being watched. I started to slow down and say aloud, Hey animals, move on back. I'm not looking for trouble here. I'm just here to get some wood. Thinking if I talked out loud, any animal within a long distance would be able to hear me, let alone understand what I'm saying. I kept going in, but it felt like my body was on high alert. I heard something move to my left. I quickly turned. Whew, just a bird. I snickered to myself. I got to the area where I had cut down half the tree from the day before. There were still quite a bit of nice pieces there that I could grab. But something was off. I didn't know what to make of it until I looked down. There were these strange footprints along the trail that just, just looked different. There were five of them. They looked half human and half animal with four toes that looked thin and long claws on them. I grabbed my cell phone and took a couple of pics because I didn't know what they were. I quickly started chopping some wood because I wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible with whatever creature was lurking out there. That's when that rotten smell came back. I could also hear some branches crackling in the background of where I was. I got scared. I picked up the wood and the axe and quickly got out of there as soon as possible. That night, when all 12 of us were sitting around the campfire, chatting away with our music blaring, it was in between songs when one of the girls named Macy quieted everyone down. Turn that thing off! Turn the music off! she yelled. That's when we all heard this strange, echoing sound. It sounded like an elk or a caribou at first, but then it turned into a low-pitched roaring sound. It kept repeating this sound for about five minutes. We all stood there, looking towards the direction of the forest to where the sound was coming from. All of us were frozen scared, wondering who or what was making this awful noise. When the sound ended, we all just watched the forest line. I'm sure if everyone was like me, we'd all have had the biggest goosebumps all over our body. One by one, we started to sit down. And after we started hearing the frogs, crickets, and owls in the background again, things got a little bit more comfortable. The rest of the weekend, we never did hear another noise like that, nor did we smell that pungent, rotting odor. When we got home from the weekend, I started looking up Monsters of Canada on the internet. This is where I came across the Wendigo. It started to make sense. The Algonquin First Nations have a long history with this creature, and since we were backing onto their park, it just makes sense. 
I googled Wendigo footprints. They matched what I photographed. And that sound? Well, I heard something similar on YouTube, but it was close enough like what we heard. I think we encountered a Wendigo out there. I'm glad we were all able to get out of there safe and sound before it became dangerous for us. Hi Canada's Great Unknown, my name is Brandon, and I recently found your channel and decided I wanted to write to you to tell you what happened to my girlfriend and I last summer while we were doing a trek to some of the furthest reaches in Canada. My girlfriend Svetlana moved here four years ago from Ukraine to finish her university degree at McGill. She'd never been across Canada before, and I thought this would be a great way to introduce her to our great country. We had met at a bar I was tending at in Vancouver while she was visiting the West Coast, and we've been together ever since. Fast forward to last year, when we decided to jump in on the social media craze, and we sold everything, bought a camper van, and decided to trek around Canada and try to become YouTube stars, Instagram, and TikTok sensations. Watching other content influencers really was a spark for us to begin this unknown journey. We were both 30. We both aren't ready for marriage or settling down with kids. So now was the perfect time to do this incredible adventure. We were driving through central Saskatchewan, on our way to Flin Flon before making our way to Winnipeg to catch a flight to Churchill for a tour of the polar bears. It was midsummer, warm, and we had the tunes cranked as we heard from the last gas station that we were at that there were some gorgeous lakes to camp along the highway if we got tired and needed to pull over or spend a couple of days. Now, you have to realize in this area of highway, you're more likely to encounter a big moose on the road than you are traffic. I may be saying that a little sarcastically, but it was so nice to be driving with barely anybody else on the road. As the blue sky was starting to shift to evening dark, we decided to take a side road that led us to the south arm of Deschambeau Lake. Since it was Tuesday or Wednesday, there was literally no one around and no concern. We pulled up to this cozy little spot along the lake that just fit our van, just past a few cabins along the way. While I was setting up and firing up the propane fireplace, Svetlana was putting out our lawn chairs, putting some beers on ice, and putting the mood lighting on that we had set up on the outside of the van for a cute little romantic ambiance. As beautiful as this area was, we had noticed this stench it smelled like rotten eggs. In her cute Ukrainian accent, Svetlana laughingly asked if I had farted, to which I denied, and I said, I thought it was you that broke wind. As the stench dissipated, we laughingly started a playful argument about whoever smelt it, dealt it, before I jumped into the van to grab our beer and a few snacks. I wasn't even in the van 30 seconds when Svetlana all of a sudden screamed for me. Brandon, get out here quick. I jumped back to the door, thinking there was a skunk or maybe a beaver by our van that had startled her. Everything okay, I asked. She pointed to the forest across the road from our spot. I turned to look, and I could see the tree branches moving at about seven feet off the ground. I pulled Svetlana closer to the door in case we had to close it for our safety. It, it's probably a bear, hun, I said, trying to ease her mind. I had a shotgun stored in the van for safety from wild animals, but with the cabins close by, I wasn't about to fire off a shot. The branches had stopped moving, but we could hear something big moving through the trees, as the forest was only about 100 feet from our camping spot. There were some heavy footsteps, some grunting and snorting, the sound started getting closer again. We started to get a little nervous. As we witnessed the branches start to move, I quickly pulled Svetlana into the van and closed the door. That's when we saw something big coming out, and we started laughing. 
Svetlana quickly grabbed her phone and started taking pictures of this giant bull moose that walked onto the road, then slowly started walking up the road until we lost sight of it in the darkness. When we felt like we were clear from the big moose, we opened up the door again and went outside. We turned the music up a little louder so any animal would know that this wasn't a party they were invited to. We drank a few beers, got a good buzz on, before realizing it was coming close to midnight, and we wanted to be back on the road by 6 in the morning. So we cleaned up our mess, very sloppily, with the beer affecting our balance. We tripped and stumbled before making our way back into the van and locking up before we headed off to sleep. I tell you, it felt like we had just fallen asleep when all of a sudden both of us were woken up with a big bang that rocked our van. It literally felt like we were hit by another car. I jumped up, threw my shorts on, and made my way to the front of the van so I could look out the curtains to see if there was a car that indeed tagged us. But there were no lights anywhere. I noticed this even before I drew the curtains back. As I looked out the front, we heard tapping on the glass windows of the back doors. Close to it, Svetlana screamed in shock, and I was quickly making my way to the back of the van to make sure she was okay. It was then our entire van started shaking, like we were involved in an earthquake. This went on for about 20 to 30 seconds before everything stopped and went silent again. Thinking there were some drunk teens or something messing around with us, I told Svetlana I was going to go outside and confront whatever or whoever was there. But what if it's a bull moose again? Or maybe another wild animal, Svetlana stated. She was right. I quickly ran back to the front of the van and fired up the engine and turned the headlights on. That's when I saw it. About ten feet in front of the van, there was this this, this thing, standing seven to eight feet tall. It had antlers, and it had a head that looked like a deer, but the head had no fur or skin on it. Its eyes were red. It was standing on two feet. The body looked like ripped skin covering its bony figure. The legs were haunched, much like a horse's, with hooves at its feet. It then screamed, which seemed to echo right through our van. Don't move, Svetlana, as it started walking towards the front of the vehicle. I've never been so scared. My body was all goosebumps, and my hands were shaking uncontrollably. As it got within five feet of the hood, I did the only thing that came to mind. I honked my horn. This seemed to startle the creature as it roared back, then started walking backwards, slowly, like it wasn't sure how the van and the people in it were standing up to it. I then revved up the van as hard as I could in order to create more noise. That's when it turned and slowly jogged right into the forest. When it was out of sight, I yelled, Hang on! I put the van in gear and started speeding down the road to get the hell out of there. What was it? Svetlana asked. I didn't answer her. Brandon, what was that thing? I don't know, I said. We were both breathing heavy. My heart felt like it was going to pop right out of my chest. We turned onto the highway, and I floored it. I didn't stop driving until we hit Flin Flon. It was near sunrise when we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, and I stopped the van. What? The actual F, I said to Svetlana. She was curled up in the passenger seat, but she took the time to look up at me. Still shaky with her voice, she said, I thought we were going to die. I sighed and told her that everything was going to be okay now and that we were safe. She nodded her head, but in reality, deep down, I thought we were going to die too. Living up in the Yukon, when it comes to wintertime, there is no better place in the world to spend a day out trekking in the thick snow powder for a day of snowmobiling. 
The trails are endless, and the scenery is phenomenal. My name is Anthony, and I'm 28 years old. I was born and raised up here, and have heard of all of the legends that come along with this historic city in the north. There's a beauty of living where we live, especially when it snows, and it snows a lot, which means I can literally ride my Polaris 850 right out of my garage and right onto the trails. It's one of the benefits of living in an area where the snow never seems to end. We have a group of five of us that ride literally every weekend. We usually end up at our buddy Josh's cabin where we crash before riding home the next day. We've done this for years and never had anything out of the ordinary happen outside of the odd moose, caribou, or cranky grizzly bear that may be milling about. But last March, we had an encounter that absolutely terrified us. Every year, we all take a week off the first week of March in order to enjoy a week of guy time. We've been doing this since we were 18, and on this particular weekend, we expected no different. But man, was it ever. I've never been one of those people who believes in the paranormal or something insane like Sasquatch or Wendigo. But what we witnessed and experienced, I really don't even know how to explain it. It was getting close to dark, which is literally around 4 p.m. We had been riding through the Grey Mountain and the Canyon Mountain areas, but as it started to get dark, we rode our sleds back to the cabin to get warm, have a drink, eat some chili that had been cooking in the slow cooker, and get ready to play some cards for the remainder of the night before getting ready for a long ride the next day. We were on day four of our trip. We were about 15 minutes from the cabin when Brian, the lead sled, started slowing down. He noticed some odd tracks in the snow that he wanted to check out. When we're that close to camp, we always like to know what's around us, for safety reasons. The prints were about eight feet apart, and they were heading towards the cabin. We followed them right until we hit this fork in the path. The tracks went to the left, into the trees, and we went right towards the cabin. Back to the tracks for a minute. What was interesting was the size of them. They looked nothing like a moose or bear. They didn't look human, and there was no way a human would be taking steps that were seven to eight feet in between tracks in that deep of snow. We're all hunters, so we're pretty familiar with the footprints around here and what kind of animals are around. But these were nothing that we've ever seen. They were thin, four-toed, and about 14 inches long. We took some pictures so we could take a look at them closer in the confines of the cabin's warmth. We made it back to the cabin in about 15 minutes, parked the machines in the carport, and then went in to warm up. We grabbed some beers, had a great meal before lounging around, all with us talking about these strange prints that we saw. None of us could explain rationally what these odd prints were. A couple of the guys were siding with a moose, but even they weren't sure. We were just guessing. About an hour later, we all sat down at the poker table to begin our poker game. We were about two hours into the game when our buddy Brody decided to head outside for a smoke. He went through the carport and lit a cigarette when he heard what sounded like someone or something tripping over the garbage cans on the side of the cabin. He slowly made his way over to the recycling can, which was just around the corner, and it was obvious to see what was making the loud noise, considering it was filled with cans. It was all tipped over, with beer and pop cans all over the ground. He saw some footprints leading away from it. Thinking nothing of what we saw earlier, he finished up his smoke, then made his way back in after cleaning up the cans. Brody came inside and stated to us that we had a visitor, which wasn't too unexpected considering where the cabin is located in the wilderness. It was nothing for animals to be sniffing around. We've seen bears come up and put their noses right up against the window. We've seen cougars on the back porch. So we just continued with our card game like it was nothing. That was until there was a strange banging at the front door. We all stopped what we were doing when we heard three loud 
thuds. It almost sounded like something was ramming their shoulder into the solid cedar door. We all got up, wondering who the hell could be doing that. We don't have a lot of crime up here, so we didn't think it was anyone breaking in. Sheldon, the owner of the cabin, went to his bedroom to grab his shotgun. Worst case scenario with a bear? We'd just fire off a couple of shots into the air, and the noise, whether it was a black bear or a grizzly, would likely scare it off. When we all got to the door, Sheldon, who was the only one armed at this time, led the way just in case the animal was right there. The door opened fast, and the sensor light to the carport was on, but nothing was there. We all walked out to the edge of the carport to see if we could see anything. I was on the left, looking to the side of the house, and just in the shadows, something caught my attention. I saw two antlers sticking up. Guys, there's a huge elk over here, I said. They all came over to take a look. This thing took a step forward into the light, and when we saw it, it was standing on two feet. That ain't no elk, Anthony, Brody stated. It had blood-red glowing eyes. It must have been seven feet tall, or more. Sheldon moved to the front, since he had the shotgun. This thing took another step forward, and that's when I saw the torso, which looked human, except with ripped flesh all over its body, like it was just hanging there, down, off of the bones. It was the grossest thing I'd ever seen. Sheldon fired a warning shot over top of it, and it backed off. That gave us the opportunity to all run back inside. We barricaded the door while the rest of us armed ourselves. Hey, it's the Yukon. Everyone is armed. We started to hear thumping on the outside of the house and on the walls. We made sure all the windows were closed, and then we turned the lights out so our eyes could adjust to anything that may be looking into the windows, but we saw nothing. Then... There was all of a sudden more heavy banging on the same door as earlier. Then it banged the door again. We thought about what we should do. We heard scratching and screeching and crashing coming from the carport. Then everything went silent. We waited for about five minutes for everything to settle down and so we could catch our breath. Then we opened the carport door. When we walked outside, my snowmobile was sitting upside down on Brandon and Sheldon's. That was 415 pounds thrown on top like it was nothing. We saw some prints on the driveway, then down the road. We followed them up until they disappeared, going up a knoll and then into the forest. We went back into the cabin, changed our drinks to water and coffee for the rest of the night in case this thing came back. Thank goodness it didn't. A couple days later, when I was on the way back home, I called one of my indigenous friends to tell him about the encounter. Robert stated that it sounded like we encountered a wendigo. I said I'd never heard of that creature before. He replied, good. And all of you were really lucky it didn't find its way into that cabin. Otherwise, you might not be alive to tell the story. Thank you.